Hello everyone and welcome. All the best and congratulations to all of you who have given the exam today of NEET PG 2023. I am Dr. Ankit and I am the faculty of anatomy in our LN platform. So today we are going to discuss some of the recall questions from anatomy. Without wasting any other time, let us start. So the question came on the jaw arrest. These are all recalls so you understand the language. There was a jaw arrest on yawning. Which muscle is attached to the articular disc? So simple, they are asking about the locking of the jaw. So that this we have discussed already in multiple of our classes before also. That the muscle that is attached to articular disc or in other ways the question has been asked previously. Articular disc is said to be a degenerated part of which muscle? And the answer over here is our lateral pterygoid. It's a lateral pterygoid muscle which helps in opening of the mouth that is attached to the neck of the mandible. So if we imagine this as the say coronoid process and condyloid process over here. This being the neck of mandible. So here the lateral pterygoid muscle will come attached over here and this is where the articular disc is a complete disc separating or dividing the TMD into two cavities. So we all know it's a quite a famous question. Articular disc and the lateral pterygoid muscle, one of the masticatory muscles supplied by mandible and helps in opening of the mouth. So I hope uh, most of you have answered it correctly. Let us see the next one. Here and the question now, this topic is now becoming a high yield topic in all the exams because if I recall correctly around 2-3 years back, the question came on this uh, same pharyngeal arches. If you remember the question, the question was on the why there is a left recurrent laryngeal nerve having a longer course. That was also a question from the pharyngeal arch. Now see this question. Which aortic arch defect is responsible for this? So we have to understand this image also. And in this image if you look at closely, it was written over here defect. It would have been very simple. If it was not written even then, you can imagine that here you have a communication between the pulmonary artery the left one and the arch of aorta, and we all know that this communication is the ductus arteriosus. Now, this ductus arteriosus is important in embryonic life, but after birth, this has to close. It becomes ligamentum arteriosus. What does it become? It becomes ligamentum arteriosus, right? So there is a patent ductus arteriosus. So this defect over here is patent the ductus arteriosus. Now they are asking you it is due to defect of which pharyngeal arch artery? Options are left four. Right four, right six, and left six. Now we all should know, we all should remember that if you go and revise all the pharyngeal arch arteries, it's a very important topic. We all know that first and second, they normally don't give rise to many structures. The third arch artery mainly gives rise to carotids, which we have done a lot of time. The fourth arch artery, again on the right and left side, has different uh, derivatives. On the right side, it gives rise to right subclavian artery. On the left side, it gives rise to a part of arch of aorta. Remember, it's a part of arch of aorta. So, first, second, third, fourth is not the answer. Fifth arch completely disappears. We are left with the sixth arch. Sixth arch, remember, that, that is the one that came in uh, two, three years back also. The sixth arch artery, if we take it from the right or left side, right, both sides is give rise to the respective pulmonary arteries. Which arteries? Pulmonary arteries. So, right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. But what happens in the sixth arch? That this pulmonary artery it prolongs or it distal continues into the ductus arteriosus, ductus arteriosus. So it's a distal part of the left 6 aortic arch artery. The distal part of the left 6 aortic artery, aortic arch artery that will give rise to this defect. Answer is our option number D, left 6 arch artery. Right? So again, high yield topic. I hope you revise it and I hope most of you have corrected it. Let us see another question over here. Now, this question. Again, these are all the high topics. If you simply revise the previous questions, you simply take care of the important topics, the exams are not that big a problem. Let us see the question. 50 year old patient, look at the age, presented with history of fall one week back. Presented with a headache, dizziness, that's a generalized uh, CNS symptoms. Gives history of chronic alcoholism. Last alcohol consumption was two weeks ago. So there's alcohol also, and we know alcohol leads to CNS degeneration in multiple places. Non contrast CT finding is given below diagnosis. So, age, history, both alcoholic history and following history, and look at the image. The CT scan, the bones are white. You can see some dilated, some uh, you can say hematoma or uh, extra axial hematoma over here. And considering the age and everything, it's probably a chronic case, and therefore it has to be a subdural or subdural hemorrhage or subdural hematoma. Now let's see other options. I am sure the fourth option also you must be remembering. But sub hemorrhage, hemorrhage, remember that is present around the rupture of the barium aneurysm. So that will be inside over here around the main vessels. Epidural hemorrhage, 
due to rupture of an artery, it's an emergency case. And uh, you know, there's a injury to the lateral side of the skull, the pelion over here. That is not a capital hemorrhage, the history is different. Here, age, history, CT findings are showing it to be subdural hematoma. This should be the global answer. Just do remember, always try to differentiate the subdural from the epidural. This might be confusing. So, I hope uh, most of you answered correctly. Let us see another one. Okay. Following mount structure will develop into. Now, as the recall questions came, the mount structure, the marking, walk over this LN twice, this uh, again, projection coming from the hind gut for the lower part of hind gut, this part of hind gut, body part of hind gut, and that is probably the LN toys. So you can go over here or over here, that is probably LN toys. Now, if you can figure out the LN toys, I hope the other answer is clear that the LN toys or after birth, it is connecting from the apex of the bladder, it is going out from the umbilicus, that becomes urethus. And that urethus becomes an umbilical ligament that is single and that is a median umbilical ligament. Which ligament? Median. So therefore, answer is over here, option number A. The median umbilical ligament. Now, what are these umbilical ligaments? Again, a very short topic or very, very important topic. If you look at the abdominal wall from inside, the lower part, we have, imagine this is the umbilicus. There are five umbilical ligaments. One over here, two going over here and two more going over here. The middle one is the median which they actually ask. This is the median because median we all know it's a middle line. It has to be single only. These two on the other side, they are medial with L over here, medial. And these are the lateral umbilical ligaments. These are lateral, that is medial. You should know they are, uh, from where they are there to the right. Median is what you are seeing in the question. Medial is, remember, it's a umbilical artery. Right, umbilical artery is not useful after birth. So it becomes a medial umbilical ligament. And these lateral are nothing but their peritoneal folds around which artery. If you guys are thinking of the inferior epigastric, the answer is correct. They are the peritoneal folds over the inferior epigastric artery, which in itself is a branch of external ligament. Right? So therefore, the answer for that question is median umbilical ligament. And let's see the other one. Are you most of the questions you have is correct only over here? Now, loss of sensation, sensory. A loss of sensation over the lateral three and a half digits on palmar side. So palmar side. Little is the thumb part, middle is the little finger part, little three and a half digits, loss of sensation. We all should know that this area, the cutaneous area, this area we have the median nerve supplying the palmar aspect, and over here we have the superficial branch of radial nerve supplying the lateral or the lateral and the dorsal aspect. So they are saying loss of sensation of the little three and a half digits on the palmar side. Basic knowledge over here, we don't need any hi fi knowledge. Basic knowledge telling us that it is nothing. But it is basically the region of the median nerve. It is the region of the median nerve, right? That we know. Now they are saying diagnosis and test. So the options, options are the very simple, I suppose. We have carpal tunnel syndrome in, in two options. We have Gaines canal in another two options. We all should know Gaines canal is on the medial side of the wrist. This is probably related to the ulnar nerve. And carpal tunnel is a worldwide and say most commonly asked question. And this is referring to the median. So we know that answer has to be between A and B option. But now there are two tests, one is Durkan, one is Froman's test. Now Froman's test we have discussed so many times in our previous classes that when you give a patient a piece of paper and you try to pull it and you ask the patient to keep on holding it, it is a test for the almond. What happens is, normally the adductor pollicis should, should prevent the paper from slipping from the patient's finger. But if the almond of the patient is damaged, the patient will flex the interphalangeal joint of the thumb via FPL, flexor pollicis longus, and that is supplied by the anterior interosseous nerve. So patient will, patient thumb will go like this. And normal patient thumb will be like this only in the adapted position. So that is about the Froman's for the alma. Now, what is Bergen test? Bergen test is a, one of the modifications of the, you can say the penal sign, where the best thumb is pressed over the carpal tunnel, carpal tunnel anatomically for a few seconds, say around 30, 40 seconds. And then the sensory changes are asked, are asked from the patient, that, uh, because you are physically compressing the median nerve in the carpal tunnel, you're looking for the changes. So that is Bergen test, therefore answer is, or option number A. I hope I hope most of you marked it correct because Froman's is a famous and I hope that one also most of you know about it. Right? Other guys and guys canal is fallen under, so don't worry about it. So again, the topic is the sensory nerve supply behind, both on the palmar and the dorsal aspect. This we should know. Let us see more. Right. Basics. It is all about basics and concepts, nothing much. Deep ring is marked in a question, deep ring was marked in an image. Defect upon which way. So you know two things over here. You need to know two things for answering this question. Do you recognize the deep in one ring? Then do you know theoretically that it is a defect in which layer of the abdominal wall? 
So when you look at the inguinal canal, the entry point is a deep inguinal ring. The entry point is a deep inguinal ring. It is deeply situated. The exit point is a superficial inguinal ring. It is superficially located. Deep inguinal ring location is it's a half inch above the mid inguinal point near the can say the femoral artery, the start of the femoral artery. There is a deep ring. We should know that deep inguinal ring is a defect in fascia transverse cell finish period. And the superficial inguinal ring is a defect in the external oblique epineurosis. Then, of this you should know, and your knowledge that you should then look for the correct option. Without looking at the option, you know that we have to search for fascia transverse cell and therefore option A is it and therefore this becomes our answer fascia transosceles okay so if they ask you the deep ring fascia if they ask you the superficial ring it is external oblique epinosis that's it right I hope most of you marked it correct but the thing which I felt in this exam and which most of the students were saying it is not completely theoretical that only you read books and all you should be able to first of all recognize the structure then your theory part will come into play if you are confused with this deep ring or superficial ring then there's no point in answering, though you're always confused. Let's see the next one. Okay. A patient presented with swelling near the left ear lobule. Left ear lobule, there's a swelling and pain. So there's a left ear lobule, there's a swelling and pain over here. Which anatomical structure is responsible for pain? Mm -hmm. Sensory supply of face. Face is a topic. We all know that the sensory supply of the face is mainly by this fifth nerve, that is a trigeminal nerve. Except, except, except the area of the parotid region or the area around the angle of mandible that is supplied by. C to C3. What is that C to C3? Greater auricular nerve. Or great auricular nerve. So that is the only exception. It's literally has been asked previously. C to C3. Now this area is near the ear lobule, right? This is the only exception over here. Great auricular nerve, C to C3. Now what happens is that is obviously the answer over here. Now try to understand. If you look, if you go to the surgery classes, they will teach you over there that when there is a parotid swelling, the ear lobule over here is uh, is lifted up. That is how there is a symmetry loss between the two ear lobules and you diagnose the parotid swell. The skin over here is supplied by great auricular nerve and that is sensory supply. So obviously that is for the pain. right? So therefore pain, great auricular nerve, there is no other correct option than that. I hope most of you correctly mark it. But remember it is cervical plexus C2C3. This you should know and uh, that is responsible for the pain. right? Let us see one more question. There was a laparoscopic mind surgery patient. And presented with pain in the lower. Okay, pain is what? Sensory or motor? It is a sensory effect. Nerve injured. So you're doing a lap surgery and uh, inguinal surgery, and there's a pain in the lower limb. We look at the options: ileal, inguinal, ileal, hypogastric, femoral, and lateral cutaneous nerve. Right? We all know that when you're doing a surgery, obviously you are going from superficial to deep. You cut the skin and the surrounding structures around it, and then you go deep and you correct the defect. That's what the surgery for. This lateral cutis nerve of thigh is close to the anterior superior spine, then it goes down and supplies the lateral part of the thigh. From where it is coming, it is coming from the lumbar plexus. If you know the root value also, that is around L2, L3. Right? Now, this lateral cutis nerve of thigh is also famous, was also famous for meralgia parasitic. I hope many of you are aware of it. It is also famous for that. Right? Therefore, if you are doing inguinal surgery, it is a cutis nerve, superficial, more chances, and that will lead to pain, a sensory defect. Answer is probably our lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. Right? If you look at other options also, ileo-inguinal nerve, ileo-hypogastric nerve, femoral nerve. Now, ileo-inguinal nerve, as the name suggests, it is based on the inguinal canal, no doubt about it. But it is, is it supplying the lower limb? It is supplying a very small part of the upper area for the femoral triangle, but mainly it supplies what? The root of the penis or the anterior one third of the scrotum, or in females, the anterior one third of the labia majora. That is the main sensory supply of it. Ileo-hypogastric is again quite can say superior to it, it supplies the hypogastric region. Femoral nerve is a deeper nerve and it has got a lot of branches, right, present laterally. But obviously this nerve over here, which is present superficially, this should be the probable answer over here if this is the question that was framed, sort of, right. Let's see another one. Huh. Surfactant, surfactant, surfactant. If surfactant is not there, what will happen? Now, you can say there's a lot of, you can say, integrated questions are there. Yeah, there's also taught in physiology and other subjects as well. Now, surfactant always lead to decreased surface tension and increased compliance of lung. That is what should be the tip of it now. Surfactant, the main function of surfactant is to increase the compliance of lung. That is increased when the surface tension is decreased. Now, therefore, opposite of it will happen when there is a deficiency of surfactant. So, the surface tension will obviously increase, right? And the compliance will decrease. So, obviously, option number A should be the correct answer. Right? 
Remember that these are basic, no hi-fi, no depth, in-depth question. You have done ambiguous questions of that level only. But you need to have a hold on the basics. That was, I guess, the main part of the exams of this year and past year, right? So this is one more question. Two month old presents with swelling over his head since birth following axial finding of the observed diagnosis. Options are very famous options. Please straighten them or an in nine years old. All are integrated normally. Cephalomatoma, capitosurinium, subgadial hemorrhage, and encephalocele. Now, encephalocele, or we start with the first one, cephalomatoma, is when there is a bleeding beneath the periosteal layer. It is limited to one bone. It is just like you can say the epidural hemorrhage, which happens on the inside of the skull. Capitosurinium subsidium is a bleeding in the deeply epineurotic layer in the loose areolar tissue layer. So that is quite widespread. It is just like contrast to you can understand like a subdural hemorrhage inside the bone. Subgill hemorrhage is beneath the gilia epineurotica. And encephalocele, they are more same. Encephalocele is a, when the brain and meninges, they protrude out. It is like you can understand like spina bifida. Okay, you have a meningomyloceal over there, this is encephalocele. If you look at the extra image over here, probably there is a clear shadow over here, swelling. This probably looks like a hemorrhage, right, and that is limited to a bone. And uh, that is also a two month old, right, because capital subsidenia, it resolves quite early. This is probably the answer over here should be the cephal hematoma option number A. Right, considering the time period, the image in the x ray, looks like cephal hematoma. When encephalocele will have a protrusion, will have a membrane, will have some brain tissues also, so that will not look as homogeneous image as what we are seeing in the patient. So, answer probably is our cephal hematoma. Right, Chucky, one more. Again, ear pain and tonsillitis. That is also called an anatomy ENT you study this. ENT you study this. Ear pain and tonsillitis. Probably it's obviously the tonsillitis mostly of a palatine tonsil. Not responsible. So that is a thing which uh, this is this is again a basic. When there's a tonsillitis, there's inflammation of the palatine tonsil. Now tonsil is sitting on a tonsillar bed. Tonsillar bed has muscles like superconstrictor. It has a handicap stool. It has vessels. It has nerves. It has artery. I mean, obviously. The nerve which is lying in the tonsillar bed is glossopharyngeal nerve. Why so? Because glossopharyngeal nerve has to give sensory supply to the pharynx. You should know that why this nerve is over here. Because it is giving sensory supply to the pharynx. The name is glossopharyngeal for the posterior tongue and the pharynx. Right? This nerve also supplies sensory to the middle ear. This is also supplying sensory to the middle ear. Right? Therefore, if this nerve is irritated in tonsillitis, the referred pain will go to the ear, that is why ear pain tonsillitis is not responsible. Has now you should be looking for the answer that is pinpanic branch of the ninth month, that is the loss of right? These are questions like you know, before you look at the options, you should be searching for the type of these are not those questions where you are looking at the options and then thinking about it. Most of the questions should be at the tip of it. I hope that most of the questions are correct. Okay, so that's all from the anatomy part. I hope most of the questions you've done are correct. Thank you and all the best for the results.